when we get to the part where we're treating one people with one person in the whole world that has this genetic condition, like that's, we're going to get there soon. Um, but it's, how do we make it cost effective? How do we make it accessible? How do we help people who don't have the privilege of getting genetic testing to understand what their conditions are? Think they're just living with these, you know, terrible symptoms and there's no condition for it. How do we help those folks get access to genetic testing, get access to these world renowned researchers? You know, right now, most folks who get genetic testing who get a diagnosis, who end up on large platforms talking about their rare disease, have a lot of money, end up raising a lot of money. Um, maybe they have connections. You know, what about, what about the kids who don't have access to those things? That's what, I, that's what keeps me up at night now in this new era of you know, just thinking about how do we really improve access this is the public health millennial career stories podcast where you'll hear about diverse career stories career strategies get tips and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey if you want to learn about public health public health careers or just hear public health stories stay tuned because you won't want to miss this Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 52. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Thank you all so much for joining me today. My apologies for not dropping an episode last week. Um, a lot of people had to reschedule and then I didn't want to stress myself while trying to get a guest, but definitely trying to get a lot of interviews scheduled now so we don't have that, that um, missing week in there. But there's also some other things that I'm also working on that you all are going to see pretty soon. So I hope you all are looking forward to that. Um, if you want to support this show, there's going to be a link in the in the description uh, to buy me a coffee, and uh, you can support the show that way. Uh, definitely make sure to subscribe, review, like this video, or uh, share it with a friend. Um, there's a lot of gems in this episode, and I hope that you enjoy. Um, without further ado, here's today's episode. Today, we have an experienced public health program developer specializing in supporting communities living with rare and complex conditions. She is most passionate about improving access to healthcare and, and tools that support wellness for vulnerable and underserved populations. Getting her Bachelor's of Science in Dietetics and Health Promotion at Michigan State University and Master of Public Health from the Boston University. She currently works as a Senior Patient Engagement Manager at All Stripes. We have Erin Smith, MPH. Welcome to the show. Hello. So excited. I'm, I'm glad that you're excited and I'm glad I'm glad that I got through that intro. Uh, it was a little tough there. But but how are you doing and how have you been coping during these times? Uh, I you know, I am so fortunate to be well, to have my health and my family and my home. And um, I really can't complain. You know, this last year has been hard for so many people in our country, in our world, and um, you know. I'm, I've got a lot of privilege, so I'm hanging in. Yeah, yeah, I definitely also resonate with that. Um, and I'm glad that you're hanging in there and that everything is going well. Um, so how, how do you identify? And then tell us a little bit about your personal background. Sure, absolutely. So um, I identify as she, her are my pronouns. Um, and I was raised by a strong single mom in a relatively low income community in the middle of nowhere, Michigan, as I like to say. Um, although it wasn't really in the middle of nowhere, just south of Lansing in a little town called Jackson. And, um, you know, that really, my foundation set, you know, the stage for how hard I think I continue to work and show up um, in my home and in my career because I watched my mom handle all the things all the time. <laughs> um, first in my family to go to college and um, my family is wicked, wicked proud of me. And so that also set the stage for, you know, just like gotta keep going, gotta keep doing that for the family. And um, yeah, that's really, that's where I come from. Okay, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad that your mother gave you the inspiration, motivation to push on and do great things. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm getting to showcase your story. And I, I hope that she's proud that you get to tell your story as well. 
<laughs> Thank you. She will be. She and grandma and aunt nanny, the, the lioness den, as my husband likes to call it when we go home, because there's it's just it's just the women around. <laughs> um, they'll be they'll be cheering from the rooftops for sure. Yeah, it's very exciting. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and I, I was actually like looking for jobs in Michigan, like in Lansing area, with Ra. After my for, for after my MPH, uh, but I got a fellowship in Alaska. But I was looking for a lot of okay. jobs in Michigan, actually. So I'm familiar. No with that city. Yeah. yeah. So just oh uh, man. Yeah. Not like I knew it, but I knew I know like where it is and like different jobs that were there at the point in time and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a surprisingly great amount of public health jobs in the Lansing area. I'd love to put you in touch with people if you ever want to leave the warm weather. <laughs> <laughs> I want to let you know. I will let you know. <laughs> So, so uh, what does public health mean to you? So a very long time ago, before I knew that public health was even a career, um, I had this amazing mentor at Michigan State who described, um, I, we worked together in health education. I was like an undergrad learning what being a health advocate was. And he described health as your freedom. And if you have your health, you don't realize you have it until you lose it and then you fight like hell to get it back. And that mantra for me was always like, huh, I never thought of health in that way of you know the way that people take their health for granted or the way that people lose their health and then how much it impacts their life. Yeah. And um, so I have always thought of public health as helping people find and protect their freedom. Because if you have your health you have a lot more advantages in the world. Um, and for those who, you know, have lost assets of their health, aspects of their health, um, you know, I really want to find program development and supports and, and changes to social structures that help people who don't have their health feel supported to, to live their life in a free way. Yeah, absolutely. Because it it is also a privilege to be able bodied and and to have all yeah. all these different privileges that we don't don't think about, like just being able to walk or just being able to walk upstairs or not having to worry yeah. about medication this day or that day or something like that. There's there, yeah. there really a lot of our small privileges that we do have with our health, and that that is a powerful way to think of it. Like uh, you lose your health, you lose your freedom, and you do you can you can definitely lose a lot of different things that you can do in life just just from losing your health so that's a great perspective yeah yeah it, ch it changed things for me I, I had no idea what public health was until that class and then that phrasing for me is just always stuck okay. yeah. what, what, what class was resonate. That? <laughs> so at Michigan State University there was a health advocate class and it was like an extracurricular you got I think two credits um, for a semester where you learned about all different aspects of really like health education. So alcohol and other drug prevention, sexual health and wellness, uh, nutrition and body image, um, fitness, just like a handful. And it was, you know, this sort of long class where you learned not only the different aspects of the health education that go into helping people understand those topics, but then by the end, when you graduate from that class, you can apply to become a health advocate. You would go out and run workshops, like peer-to-peer -peer workshops on campus. And that's how I got started, my start in public health. I didn't know it was public health at the time. Um, that's how I got my start. Yeah, that's most people, they don't they don't know it's public health and public health is most things. So, you, <laughs> so there's yeah. a high, high probability that <laughs> something you're doing was public health or public health related, that, that is for sure. Okay. Yeah. So you got your bachelor's of science in dietetics and health promotion at Michigan State University. So what was the thought process for getting this degree, this like going into this degree? Or did you even oh, start in this degree? I did not start in this degree. So, um, so my mom put herself through school late in her forties um, and she decided that she wanted to become a nurse. This was after I had started um, my first year. I actually spent my first year at community college and I transferred to Michigan State I thought, well, mom's during doing nursing school seems cool. I'll do, I'll be a nurse. Like that's a guaranteed job when I get out of school. So I put on, you know, I go to my nursing classes and I'm like, oh, anatomy, physiology. This is super interesting. Volunteer in an emergency room. Cause I watched a lot of ER as a kid, you know, the, the show. Um, and I thought like, this is going to be the thing. So my second, first day in the ER, um, we had actually a, a, a young adult come in. 
he had gotten drunk. He fell in a garbage can. Um, he was super like, he cracked his head open. He needed a lot of help. So I'm in the ER room, head nurse says, go get some ice. So I go get some ice, I bring it back into the room and like the smell of garbage can and the blood and all the things. And I was like, okay, we are doing this. <laughs> the head nurse looks at me, she goes, you need to go back and get some more ice. And I was like, no, no, no I just, I brought this big thing of ice. And she's like, yeah, it's time it's for you. Get out. <laughs> she, she came to find me at the nurse's station. I was white as a sheet. And uh, she just was like, I don't know. Like, I think you need to get your stomach before you come back. <laughs> I called my mom and I was like, I don't think this is for me. And a handful of other things happened. I failed a class and I was like, all right, this is getting, I need to graduate. And I had been one year at community college and I needed to graduate in three years. Um, just financially, I just didn't want to be that fifth year pop up for me. And I was like, what can I switch to? Talking with my health advocate, you know, buddies and Someone was like, well, I'm studying nutrition. It's pretty cool. And you use a lot of the prereqs from nursing. And so there it was, became a dietetics major. Um, and for me, that always, I always encourage people to like try things in their undergrad and not be afraid to switch majors because even if it had pushed me to that fifth year, I ended up doing four and a half years. I did like a summer study abroad, which we'll get to, but um, you know, it's, it's okay, right? Like it's okay to try something and early in your life say, mm, try that, it's not for me. I'm gonna move on to something else. You know, people do that for most of their career, you know, it makes it more interesting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. Cause I wanna say the, the average person switches their major like four or five times during their, their time in the career. And the, the with North American, US and Canada, the, the the university system is set up in a way that you're able to switch majors a lot and you can still have your core classes and still get a, a different major pretty easily. Um, so with, within like a good time frame. So it, there's yeah. a power in that. And I think it is important to try out different things because especially that's how like, I'm just rethinking like we shouldn't have people 18 years old deciding to go to college and choose what what they want to do that that's such a tough thing to think about just in, in life but i can't deal with that systemic issue by myself or just but yeah so i i definitely think that it is important to just have those different opportunities to try out different things and don't be afraid to try them out because you learn what you know and you learn what you don't know yeah absolutely and i mean who benefits from graduating with $80,000 worth of debt on a degree that you didn't love, you mm. know, that you didn't learn something from. Um, that's a whole other topic we could unpack. Student loan debt is the, yeah. the worst, but. Correct, correct. And yeah. that's why that's why it's another like point in your story going to community college that probably help, helped you out a, a whole lot on the financial side, as well as giving you some time to mature and think about what you actually want to do in college. And I think that's a, a path that a lot of people do not, or they underestimate the, the just how, how beneficial that could be for you in the long run. So like, I'm a yeah. huge advocate for that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I should like add it to my LinkedIn as a point of pride at this point, because I think not enough people are sharing their community college story. Man, I was devastated that I didn't get into Michigan State my first year. Like, I felt like an absolute failure. I thought my career is going to tank and I'm going to be stuck in this system that I'm in. And um, oh, I thought all kinds of terrible things about myself for having to go to community college. And now I look back on it as like, wow, exactly what you said, Omari. I learned so much, I matured, I saved money. Um, and, you know, I still count a lot of the people I went to community college as closest friends. Um, so I'm really grateful for that experience. I hope more people take advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you should put that on your LinkedIn profile just because it helps. Like if someone goes on it and say, oh, I'm in community college too. This person is in community college because I recently had a conversation with Dr. Charlotte Huntley, who also has a public health podcast. And she yeah. was saying that she she did a commencement speech and she went to community college as well. And she made it a point to say that that was like she went to community college because a lot of them, they think, that, oh, she's some kind of big doctor now. She could have never done this community college and things like that. But I think so many great people have done great stuff from going to community college. So yeah, just putting that out there. Um, awesome. Yeah. So so tell me, was the health advocate class um, before or after you went on your study abroad experience? 
it was before. So my final year, I had to finish six more credits um, in my, to finish my dietetics. So I graduated in May and then I boarded a plane direct to Europe to do my study abroad experience. I found this super cool food law um, study abroad that was offered through Michigan State. So MSU has a really big study abroad program, which many, many more universities and colleges now are on board. Um, 20 years ago, it, it wasn't the case, um, but at MSU, it was a big push. And so that's how I finished my degree. My degree was actually on the food law study abroad experience. And it was awesome. I spent three weeks, you know, going to the European Union, um, like whatever building in Paris. And uh, we went to, um, the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. So, you know, we, we sort of hopped around and we learned about food labeling, um, you know, large animal, um, yeah, what did they call it? Like epi epizoology, I think is what they called it. Um, you know, how pigs become bacon around the world. And it was just really not anything I ever thought I would find interesting, but I did and I found it very exciting to be standing in like the epidemic decision room of the World Health Organization and going like, wow, this is where, you know, at the time bird flu was a big thing. You know, this is where those decisions are made. And as the COVID-19 crisis was unfolding, you know, over the last year, I was thinking, wow, like this is where some of those early decisions, I stood in the room where they were making some of those early decisions about, you know, what was gonna happen from the first case of COVID-19 and on. Um, and so I encourage everybody to take a study abroad experience because you never know how that experience will apply down the road, but it will, absolutely will. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's awesome that you got to go in all those rooms and just, I guess, experience the magnanimous awesomeness of public health in so many different aspects and learn about epizoology, which is something that people talk about a lot. But it's a huge <laughs> part of like our world because of agriculture and food is a huge part of our world. So there's a lot, a lot in that. And I know a lot of people do the MPHs and do like vet related stuff. And I got to get someone on the podcast with, with some sorts of background and an epizoology or something around that. Definitely. Um, I'm going to look back at who I studied abroad with because at least two of those people were veterinarians at the time. And um, yeah, so cool. I also got to learn why champagne is labeled champagne and Prosecco is labeled Prosecco, like literally comes from a specific region. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, for France, Perks of being in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is for sure, that's for sure. So, so what, when you were going into this study abroad experience or before, did you know, or did you have an idea of what you were thinking of doing after you graduated or did you just not sure? I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. I had a job lined up um, while I was at the study abroad, on the study abroad trip. Um, I knew I was going to get to come back and work actually as a health educator at Michigan State. Um, so I was really fortunate. I had like this part-time job lined up and I felt really good about it. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do forever because that was a part-time job, but I kind of had hoped that I would get to be a college health educator forever because um, I really enjoyed being on a college campus and doing all of that. But at the same time, I was running an HIV testing clinic on campus and I thought, well, I can take this and apply it to, you know, HIV and AIDS education and prevention. And so I really thought that might be the next leap that I make is, you know, to, to move on to something like Lansing Area AIDS Network or one of those kinds of community um, organizations. And that just didn't work out for me. And that was okay because I ended up becoming a full-time health educator at Michigan State. Um, I got promoted to be the director for the Center for of Sexual Health and um, Sexual Health Promotion. And that was a ton of fun because then I got to teach the health advocates that were coming up. Um, you know, and really sort of take that undergraduate experience it, and directly apply it to, um, you know, bringing up new new folks in the public health world. Yeah, it's always, it's always great when you can give back. Um, so yeah. how, how, how did you get that part-time job lined up? And then how did you get the health educator for this uh, Center for Sexual Health Promotion? Yeah, it's a good question. So it really was a pipeline from the health advocate class that I took as a, as actually my first year on campus. So I took that health advocate class, 
started being like this peer educator on campus, grew that role. And then when I graduated, there was a part-time job to help continue running the HIV testing um, clinic. And because I had become a test counselor certified through the state of Michigan, I was able to take on that role. And I had a wonderful mentor um, who had her master's of public health from the University of Michigan. She had come in and had taken over the, the role of running the Center for Sexual Health Promotion. And um, she was just so wonderful to me. She and my longtime mentor, um, who was now the head of the health education, you know, they had this opening on their team and, and I was able to get that. Um, but I think it, it really came from that early decision to volunteer um, and see what came of it. So that was very, very fortunate. You definitely have to put yourself out there to to get those opportunities to come back to you. So it's 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 fortunate, yeah. but it's not as as fortunate as you think it is because you put yourself <laughs> in the place for for the things to happen, and that's what people have to do, and they have to know if there's in a position you can volunteer, and then from there you can find connections or find a different work or different things through that one opportunity. So that is good to know, and thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So did, what, what, share just a little bit about what you did as a health educator. Yeah, so I, um, I did the strategic planning for all of the health education that pertained to sexual health and relationships on campus. And so we had a whole team of health educators that specialized in like alcohol and other drug prevention, fitness, nutrition, body image. And my sort of sweet spot was really in the sexual health wellness space. And so um, I created... A, a suite of programs kind of building on what already existed. So I would go out and do guest lectures in academic settings where it made sense that there was a class that overlapped with the topic area or they needed some, someone to come in and talk about healthy relationships or you know, really different aspects of sexual health and wellness. Um, so academic lectures and then teaching the health advocate program and, and nurturing young peer, um, peer to peer uh, coaches as we called them, health coaches to go out and do workshops like in the dorms and um, you know different events and, and that kind of thing. That was my favorite because we taught a class but then we also got to go out into the dorms and like be at these student events. Um, I did a lot of intersection um, with our diversity, equity and inclusion groups on campus. So at the time while I was working um, as a health educator, a lot of information coming out about health disparities it wasn't new, but it was garnering a lot of interest, particularly as we were looking at our health data on campus and inequities among our student population and recognizing that there really needed to be better support in place for, um, you know, for addressing specific populations and specific risks and really wanting, hung so hungry to understand what was happening in the data from my perspective. So I did a lot of work with our um, diversity, equity, equity and inclusion folks on campus who were running you know, um, summer camps for um, first year students who were coming in having um, been first in their um, family to come to college, um, doing really specific outreach for those folks, doing really specific outreach with um, uh, RAs on campus to make sure that they had healthy spaces and places to have conversations about HIV testing, about condom use. Um, really, you know, that was like my wheelhouse. And then we would fold in like other aspects like um, alcohol and other drug prevention and that kind of work. And that was really my first understanding of health disparities at like a very minor level. Mm -hmm. And I realized how much I absolutely did not know mm -hmm. and how much I needed more to really understand the data, the epidemiology of it, the, the story that it was telling. And that's when I knew I needed to move on from my role at Michigan State. And it was both maddening and scary to, to make a decision to leave a full-time job. My family was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why would you leave a full-time job to go back to school? And I was just like, there is something here and I have to learn more about it. And I know I, there wasn't um, a public health program at Michigan State at the time. I took an epi class to try and understand the data better. 
um, to tr try and get my skill set up there, but I just was so hungry to just do that, dive in deeper. Um, so I ended up leaving after three years for Boston University. Okay. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm glad that you found, that's, that's cool that you found something that made you decide, okay, I just can't live my life not understanding and not knowing this, and I want to dig in, into this more and just learn more, and you decided to jump in and get education around it. I think that that's very admirable. Um, it, it's definitely played out well for you right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, but I know that that was a tough decision for you, especially with, with your family on your back saying like, why are you doing this? So what, what, what was the mindset you, you had go, going through this, this tough decision to choose and to pursue your MPH? Yeah. Um, I always felt this pull to, to leave Michigan, to see more of the world to see how other people live. I also got some really amazing advice along the way when I started talking to people about wanting to go to my MPH, who said, start looking at researchers and professors and where they teach. Researchers and professors that are working in the field of study that you're interested in, who are writing papers that kind of are just really interesting because I was a total nerd. I had like binders full of, like remember when you used to print stuff out, like <laughs> printed, um, published articles. Um, so that's what I started doing. I would read articles and then I would look at the professors and see, well, where are they, where are they um, doing their research? And then someone also gave me the tip of not only where are they doing their research, but are they actually teaching at that school or are they just like in name only, which is something I didn't know either. So hot tip for our public health students. <laughs> um, but that was really, you know, for me, that was sound advice. Um, it's how I decided on Boston University because Anita Raj, Dr. Anita Raj was doing really incredible um, sexual health work research, uh, particularly around um, women who were living in India where they were having high, extremely high rates of HIV, extremely high rates of early sexual debut, um, societal issues you know there were just all these structural things in place that for me I was like holy crap I there's another word I would say but you know I had no idea there was <laughs> there was all of this going on and so um for me I just I had saved up a little bit of money because Michigan State makes you save your for your retirement and I learned you can grow from your retirement. So I had this first job with this little pot of money and I was like, yeah, I can stretch three grand in Boston. I could do this. It was not easy. <laughs> um, but I lined up a job. I lined up a job uh, at BU because you got half off your tuition tip. You still get taxed on the half that you <laughs> get off. <laughs> you will be poor in December. It's okay. You're going to make it, but it was, it was a struggle. Um, but I think back to your original Russian, uh, your original question, um, what was my thinking? It was really wanting to connect with other people who were doing what I thought was this worldly academic research in a field that I was so hungry to understand. You know, I think um, going way back to my personal description, there was a lot about sexual health and wellness that was not explained to me, that was a mystery, um, that was, you know, at times challenging. You know, I graduated in a class with, I think there were at least 20 young girls that were pregnant at any given time during our final two years in high school. And so sexual health for me kind of always kept bubbling up as an interest. And so I followed that path and that's how I ended up at BU. Okay, okay. And, and, and yeah, sexual health, it's, it's amazing how much we don't, it isn't taught in the US. Cause I just know, I know for myself, I got classes of it when I was in um, high school. And when I came to university here, I was like, oh, a lot of people just don't know some like simple, simple the basics. Things. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that you think they would understand. But, but then you understand, oh, they don't teach them this in school. And then parents are rarely going to talk to their children, or at least not talk to them in the type of way that's actually going to be educational, helpful, unless they give them a book or something like that. So, it's, so yeah, it's a, there, there are a lot of issues there. And then 
I don't know, because because as we know in public health, like prevention, people because we know children, people in general are going to have sex. So yeah. why not tell them about the safe ways to have sex? Tell them about pregnant preg pregnancies and all those other things early on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's I guess I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about that or. Yeah, I mean, I just completely agree. I think it's fascinating, actually, from your perspective to come to come here and go like, wow, they, these people <laughs> do not <laughs> talk to each other about a lot of things, <laughs> for sure. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that for me always struck me as an opportunity to sort of, you know, give back in a way to right what was wrong, I guess, you know, from, from my past. And I think in a little bit of self-reflection, it was probably me sort of going, all right, you know, little Erin, we're going to figure this out. Big Erin's going to solve the problem and she's going to go back. She's going to save all the kids. <laughs> and, you know, um, that's probably where, where the push came from. But when I, I got to be you, what Dr. Raj was actually studying, um, she started getting more into violence prevention and really trying to understand power dynamics. And I found that so fascinating. And I started to learn from Dr. Emily Rothman about that even more where she was studying pornography. And I was like, public health researchers are studying pornography? This is life changing. Like, <laughs> what is this world? What is this public health? You know, I think you said earlier, like, public health is everything. Mm -hmm. It's everything. Um, and I got really fascinated by that. Um, I ended up doing um, a couple of research papers on violence prevention, thought that that was gonna be sort of the shift mm -hmm. for me. That was gonna be the, the second career shift where I was like, all right, you know, let's, let's go down this path. Not a lot of people are talking about violence in this public health way, um, about discourse. What is our public discourse around sexual health and how does that benefit, you know, violence continuing? Um, so got really interested in that, um, took a job at Education Development Center, which like brought all the things together. And that was really, really cool to see. So I joined, um, it was the Higher Education Center for Alcohol, Other Drug and Sexual Violence, Preve or Violence Prevention, not just Sexual Violence. But I was specifically in the violence prevention work. Um, as a research associate at first and then an assistant project director. And what we were doing was working on, um, on university campuses who had like federal grants to do violence prevention work or alcohol prevention work. And we were helping them set strategy and look at their data and create programming. So it was like a consulting role. And I was like, this is wicked awesome, right? Like what a, a progression of getting to go back and give back to to my higher ed colleagues um in that way and that was awesome yeah that is awesome tangential question is wicked yeah is that, is that does that come from boston or from michigan <laughs> it comes from boston <laughs> it comes from boston yeah <laughs> just, just check it just check it's, it's, it's not something i hear i hear too often i i feel like it's like i'm watching a harry potter movie right now but i, <laughs> I love it <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome yes yeah. so um did did go into BU did you have a concentration was your concentration epidemiology was it sexual health something related to that or what, what was your concentration yes it was social and behavioral sciences okay and, yeah and and I know you said that you were you studied up on and the professors that were at, at the university and the work they were, they were doing did you reach out to the professors before you got to BU or what what was that process like for you Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm so glad you're asking these questions. So um, before I applied, I emailed the chair of the department that I thought I wanted to be in because that's where the researchers were. I reached out to Dr. Bowen. She was incredible. She actually wrote back to me and I was like, you're back. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then um, I actually set up a meeting with her and I had the great privilege, I um, have, who is now my husband, a dear friend who was living in Boston at the time. I called him up and I was like, look, I'm gonna come out to BU. I'm gonna take a look at the school. I set up a meeting with Dr. Bowen because I could be there in person. She met with me. 
And I was like, I can't, I can't believe she's meeting with me. And she's like this prestigious cancer researcher. She made the time for me. And I think the lesson here is don't be afraid to ask for time, to take up space because people will respond to that. Um, you know, just be friendly, be kind, ask for help and people will absolutely extend a hand. Um, and if they don't try again, you know, with someone else, like don't let the door shut and, and move on. So I showed up, I talked with Dr. Bowen. Um, she actually said, well, there might be a, a job open, you know, and that's how you get half off tuition. And I was like, what? I can get, you know, I feel like all of these like this naive kid, but people don't know unless you talk about it. I had no idea. Um, so that was awesome and very fortuitous that I got to meet with her early on. And then I also knew from her perspective, when was the right time to apply, right? She was like, apply as soon as possible, absolutely get it in before February 1st. Um, you know, she just gave me little tips of like, well, what should I write in my essay? And she was like, write what you're passionate about. You know, she's just, she was so open and warm. So definitely reach out early, make those relationships. At the same time, when I knew I was coming on campus to meet with Dr. Bowen, I sent emails to Dr. Raj, to Dr. Brockman and a handful of other professors, just letting them know I was gonna be around. It was December, so it was getting close to the end of the year or end of the school semester. And a couple of them did write back and offered to meet with me as well. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad that you shared that. I'm glad that you did that. And that, that's a great, a great thing that people don't do. Um, and like as you said, you were like surprised that they emailed you back, but but pe people do email people back for the most part. And and as you said, like you can't give up on just one opportunity. You have to like keep on going, and you have to keep on asking because if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So. It, you're in the same place asking and being told no so just take that as okay and continue going and ask again ask someone else asking a different way or something like that yeah, yeah so, absolutely yes that's awesome um so and then you said during your time you you were different you had some different roles that you spoke about just now um the research associate and then did you become an associate pro project director while you were in the mph program or was that after you graduated that was after I graduated. Um, so I, yeah, so I did the RA role while I was finishing my degree. So I, it's kind of, there was some overlaps, right? So I worked at BU School of Public Health for my first year, got half off my tuition, realized I was still going to get taxed on that and was not making enough money. So um, I started looking, I found a connection to Education Development Center through my network, because that's how people find jobs now. It's it, you know, you, you, that's why you've got to put yourself out there. That's why I love it's, it's your how, podcast. It's how I found you through my Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like I felt so awkward sending you that message like, oh, Mari, I love that podcast. But I was like, no, I just let him know that I appreciate, you know, what's going on in the world. And that's how, how you make things happen. So, um, so working at BU, left after my first year, went to EDP, finished my MPH part-time. So instead of doing full-time work, I did part-time work. Things it took me a bit longer, but I learned so much. Um, and I wish more people realized that they could do their education slow. Like, that's okay. Um, I think so many people are like, rush, rush, rush. I certainly was in my undergrad because I was just financially motivated. Like, no, I, I can't figure out how to make this work. So I'm just going to blaze through it. And my graduate degree, I had the fortune to realize that I could do part-time and still get my loans and also work a full-time job. And it was busy. It was pretty crazy busy, but it was doable when you're 22 and don't have a lot going on. Yeah. And what, what, what benefits do, do you have to, to do in the program slow? What, what advice would you give to someone if they're asking you if they should do that? Yeah. So working, getting to work and apply my what I was learning in class straight away is a huge benefit. Um, you know, on one day I was learning what a logic model was, and two weeks later there was an opportunity to apply logic modeling um, in a real life situation. And so, if you can find yourself, even if it's a research assistant job or you know something else, where you're getting to directly apply your education, you just learn it so much more deeply. I think. Um, you know, or volunteer, like even if there's like volunteer experiences that are going on. 
Um, another benefit I would think, you know, to going slowly was not taking more than two classes in a semester for me just allowed a lot more absorption of the material. Um, yeah, I, I read textbooks, like read them instead of scanned them for the answers to, <laughs> to the upcoming exam. Um, and that's probably also a big difference between undergraduate and graduate degrees too, is that most often, I, I hope, if you're spending money on a graduate degree, it's because you want to go deeper, you want to understand the material more, more deeply and be able to apply that directly in your career. Yeah, I don't know what your experience was in your MPH. Did you do it full time? Um, yeah, I did it full time, but but I, I I can relate to the part of it where you said that you get you get to because my in my internship because I had an internship which was twenty hours a week was it twenty hours I can't remember full time wow I can't remember if it was twenty it's between ten ten to twenty hours a week let's say and from that I was able to use the the information I got through some of my classes especially like around community health needs assessments and that really mm -hmm. helped help me get my fellowship and get my job right now so like yeah I, I definitely think there's a lot of benefit and even if you're not doing it slowly but practicing or getting an opportunity where you can practice the things because you learn it better that way and I think this mm -hmm. slow this to, to slow down the process of the MPH will definitely help you learn or just retain the in information more because it can it can feel like you're cramming information at points in time when you just have so many different projects and things that you're working on. So so I can I can respect that. I can respect that for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I you know I think if I had had the opportunity to go full time and adjust my work life to fit that, that could have been just as amazing you know it's really you just have to look at your life and shape it the way you want I think that's something nobody told me I could do either until later in life it's like you actually you're an adult maybe you don't feel like it but you are <laughs> and you can shape this how you want to and obviously there are a lot of things that go into play like that there's you know financial s sustainability what's your rent like what's your you know your practical costs for things but if you can shape your life early on to fit the way you you want it to you're just gonna set yourself up better for later in life um it comes from a place of privilege though so not everybody can do that true true but to your point as well you said like when when you were young you're young and you're able to do all these different things and i think that is an advantage that we do have and some of us take that for granted and spend more time watching Netflix than doing productive <laughs> things that can actually help us. So, so I definitely think yeah. that people should should have that sort of, okay, let me do a lot when I'm young. Maybe that's just to learn, maybe to, that's to learn what you don't like, just to get experience, build your network. There's so many positive things from, from doing that. And I think you should be putting yourself in a lot of spaces, especially early on in your career and in your public health life, for sure. Um, well so, said. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so were you um, promoted to project director after afterwards at the Education Development Center? And what did that promotion entail? Yeah, so um, my EDC career was super fun. It was like nine years of just really cool learning. Um, I started out in that higher education consulting role. And then the federal funding for that um, was going away and I was looking at our portfolio of what else EDC did. I realized we had this prestigious researcher on staff who was doing HIV prevention programming, Dr. Lydia O'Donnell. And I was like, wow, didn't know she was here. And, uh, and my friend Robert actually was an RA for her. And he and I would like, we were working on completely separate projects, didn't really know what each other was doing. We were just in different spaces, um, but we would hang out and we would talk about life. And Robert was like, well, if your funding's ending, why don't you be like, you do sexual health stuff in your background. Why don't you come down and talk to Lydia? And I was like, I can't talk to Lydia. Lydia is <laughs> Dr. Lydia O'Donnell. Like she's not gonna hire me. And, uh, and she did, she did hire me. Um, I went down to, to Lydia and I was like, here's what I can do. And she's like, well, we've got space for a research assistant. We could probably bump that up to a research associate, um, but you're gonna have to like, run adolescent youth behavior risk surveys like 
like run copies of them and then staple them together and then like deliver them to the schools. Mm -hmm. She was like, it's not the glamorous consulting you've been doing. Like, this is like real research. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can do that. That's awesome. <laughs> and I, then I did it. And I was like, this is hard. So, like shout out to the RAs of the world. That is the hardest work in public health, I think. <laughs> so what? Um, getting all those surveys back and batched and off to the, you know, the data processors learned a lot. Um, and in that, I got uh, promoted to an associate project director when we got a really big um, CDC funding to um, run a what was called a CEBA center, a capacity building assistance center. We ran um, training and technical assistance for uh, across the U.S. for community-based HIV and AIDS educators. And so what that meant like was, you know, the CDC has like the, this evidence-based list of programming that um, is, has been proven effective through research for certain um, programming in, in these community centers. And so we would go out, we would train folks on these programs. How do you run an effective program called Voices Voces or Assistas or, you know, all of these different things. I didn't do the training. I did like the coordinating of it, right? So the project management of it, community um, place would reach out to us, say, we need this programming. I would line up the, um, the trainers who were gonna go out. I would um, collect the, uh, what do they call those at the end? The surveys at the end, like the quality assurance survey is making sure people met their CEs, all of that documentation and processing and making sure that our training was effective from a data standpoint, reporting that back to the CDC. What was cool about that was that I always, thought when I was in public health for a brief moment, I thought I would get a job at the CDC. And then someone told me like, oh, you don't want to work at the CDC. There's all this red tape. It's, you know, whatever. And so <laughs> they were like, you want to be a consultant. If you, if you want to make money, you want to be a consultant. I don't think that's actually true, but I sort of got a little jaded from, <laughs> from working at the CDC, I guess, um, from that comment. But I thought the CDC folks that we talked to were so glamorous, like they were in Atlanta, Georgia at the CDC. And I, I felt like I was talking to experts all the time. And I was, I really was. Um, so I loved that job. And then we got some additional funding to run um, another center. I shifted over to working with women veterans who needed access to mental health and building out online tools um, for women veterans and just, my whole career at EDC was like always going like this, right? Like, oh, you're over here and now we're gonna use your skill set in this different topic area. But they all kind of overlapped, right? When you think about women veterans, we're talking about the overlap of mental health, which also overlaps with HIV AIDS prevention work and um, you know, sexual health and violence prevention. It's sort of public health is so intersectional and it was proven that way at EDC. Like every career I switched to had an overlap with my previous one. And that was really cool to see. Yeah, and I, th I think it's important that you also mentioned that the skill set that you had was pretty much the same. It's just changing in topic area. And that's something I always tell public health students, like don't get too tied down on topic areas and things like that, because mm -hmm. I feel like that's a harder way to go about finding a job rather than having a skill set and then being able to plug into different things. And then from there, I think you'll find what you like more and you can discover different paths through that as well. Yes, absolutely. So accurate. Um, so my skill set, I don't think I've talked about, is really in project management and then eventually rolled into client management. Um, and so I think and dream in spreadsheets. And if you ask my husband, he will tell you that's absolutely true. <laughs> I think everything about our children's schedule is in a spreadsheet. Everything about what we're going to eat for the week is in a spreadsheet. Um, and that directly applies to everything I do in public health too. Yeah, awesome. T tell me tell me more about, is it like Google Sheets? Yeah, so I started in Excel. Mm -hmm. um, that was my sweet spot. And now I've graduated <laughs> many years ago to Google Sheets. Um, <laughs> more collaborative tools as you need to be now that everyone's remote um and then i also like smart sheets personally what, what is smart yeah, sheets? If you have smart sheets has like a little bit more um robust tools to auto schedule 
um, reminders for folks and you can loop in others and send out emails. You can also collect information, um, like you can create a survey to populate information into the spreadsheet. So it costs a little bit of money though. So you gotta be someplace that to invest in Smartsheets. Okay. <laughs> Not a personal tool. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome though. And I've never heard of that. So I'm definitely gonna check it out because it, so, it sounds like there's definitely a lot of utility in that. Um, yeah. so go back to your project management skills. Like how, how did you develop that? Because it seems like you, all, you also like did a lot of like delegating or management of personnel people. So t tell me how you cultivated that skill. On the fly, mm -hmm. honestly, on the fly. I, um, not until 2014, 2015, well into my career, like a few years out of graduate school, not until then did I take a formal, like it was like a PMD pro, so not quite a PMP. The PMP is the project management, you know, the certification people um, have. I had like the, the step down version for people who work in nonprofits <laughs> and, um, but great skill set to have, you know, great certification to have um, on, on your docket. And I learned a lot from that, but I never had formal training until then in project management. So there was a bit of it in my public health programming, but it was mostly couched in like logic models and strategy planning and, you know, all these like fancy words, but it was project management. So I wish that I had found a class during my graduate degree that was really like straight up project management and understanding the linkages and the efficiencies that you can create, um, especially when managing personnel. And that's still something I feel like I'm learning on the fly. I don't know if others are doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine that a lot, a lot of other people also feel, feel the same way. That's awesome. And I was gonna ask you if, if you did uh, your PMP because when, when you said like spreadsheets, you put everything in spreadsheets. I'm like, oh, that definitely sounds like like some like project management professional. But yeah. I've never heard of the PMD. So thank you for mentioning that. And uh, I'll definitely mm -hmm. check that out and recommend it to people as well. Yeah, so what sorts of things do you learn in the PMD? Um, so I learned uh, how to create efficiencies in a staff and staff and resource management. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a couple of tools to build out spreadsheets with those kinds of um, like reminders um, who's responsible for what. I learned uh, the importance of establishing who's the driver of something and who just needs to be informed mm -hmm. and how to ensure that meetings are efficient and you don't have too many cooks in the kitchen, um, which I think as, as a relatively inclusive and people pleasing person is very hard for me <laughs> to put into practice. And I was like, oh, everyone should just come to the table. But in the last year where everyone is remote, I've actually realized it is very freeing for people to just be informed. Like they don't have to be, always have to have a seat at the table. You'll know if you, if you didn't include somebody, you'll know if they should have been at the table, <laughs> you know, for the vast majority, um, you know, identifying who the driver is for things and then making sure that um, your meetings are efficient and build onto something, right? So at the end of a meeting, what's the now next later steps? Who's in charge of those now next later steps? And just ensuring clear communication. For me, that solidified in the PMD program, I think, in a way that I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants before. And then I realized there are actual tools that you can use to put in place. Um, something that also the PMD, I think reiterated for me that I had just maybe learned along the way, but helped me really structure was um, storyboarding out the steps to get to the place of success early, like at the beginning of the project. So that you're not in the middle of the project going, oh, whoops, we didn't plan for that. You know, that, that's going to happen. Right? Things are going to pop up in a project, particularly when you're working with populations that you don't expect and you have to account for those kinds of things. But just planning all the way to the end and then circling back um, to the front and making sure, you know, there's a sol there's solidness in that plan. <laughs> um, yeah, I found that really helpful. Okay, yeah, that, that is definitely very helpful. Did you did you learn about Gantt charts by chance? Yes. <laughs> you don't seem too pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Gantt charts, I can never. They just for me, 
they don't do it for me. I know a lot of people love Gantt charts. It's probably going to get a lot of haters in the comments. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I guess maybe I just never made a Gantt chart work for me. I, I like to stick with logic models and spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if it, if it works for you, and then why not? I just brought this out because I, I thought about it. Um, how how yeah. intensive or long is the PMD? Oh, it was um, so it was offered through my work, which okay. is another thing to know. Your work should pay for everything. Like, this is something I did not know. If you can get your work to pay for your MPH, do it. If you know, or your MBA, or whatever it is you're looking for, companies will pay for things more than they ever used to. So um, my company offered the PMD Pro free to um, certain folks at a certain level in our company. Um, we did some advocating for some earlier career folks. So don't be afraid to sort of say, hey, I heard there's this training. I think I'd really like to take it. I understand it's only for certain people, but is there any way I could listen in? Or is there another opportunity for me to take it at a later date? Like just press the issue because I think something that happens as um, companies get deeper in their you know org chart they start to forget about the early career folks and then they get down the line and they realize they haven't hired a new you know cohort of RA for five years and now all their RAs are about to leave because they're not getting promoted up and so there's really this um, this need for companies to change the way they're thinking about early career. Like, I'm so tired of the outputs of um, job descriptions that are like, you need to have five years of experience and your master's and it's an early entry job. It's like, you know, first job out of school and it's like, guys, where are they going to get the experience? Like, no, we shouldn't, everybody shouldn't be working for free until they're 25. This makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something while I was at EDC, we also created a, a paid internship pipeline, which is something I advocated heavily for because we needed younger folks to come in. And then we needed younger folks to be advocated for, to show up in those PMD trainings, to show up in, in the continuing education because if we don't invest in the early career. When y'all wanna retire, there's no way to take the job, you know, or, or there will be, but you, it's just frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, I, I completely, completely, completely understand that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I think that everyone should try to advocate for those paid internships for people that then just give them opportunities. And as well as like when you're negotiating, try to make sure that you are talking about professional development and making sure that there's a budget set aside or that you can go to these conferences or they can pay for your education or certifications or whatever the case might be. Just think about those things because those are things that you can also negotiate um, in, in your like job packets, I guess, <laughs> it's employment packet yeah. offer. So, so don't, don't ever forget about those things because those are so important, especially if if you're just trying to, if you're not sure what you want to do, I, I think it's, it's so important to have that flexibility to build on and grow skill sets so you can do different things or maybe tap into different parts of the organization or outside of the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Join the um, American Public Health Association or your state level public health association. That's the best way to get career networking. Your job should pay for that membership. And if they won't, you know, see if there's an alternative comp compensation. I think, you know, especially early career, um, $95 stands out as a, a career membership investment, you know? So like maybe there's another way to get that paid for if they won't pay for your membership, but just absolutely advocate and negotiate for those things because they really do go along with your career development. Yeah, absolutely. And then so after your uh, associate project director role, you moved on to a senior program manager at Backpack Health at A. Conica Minolta Service. Um, yeah. So, so, so tell, me, <laughs> tell me about what the organization is and then about the thought process for getting this role. Yeah, absolutely. So Backpack Health um, is a uh, electronic patient reported outcomes platform and more. Um, Really, the goal with with Backpack Health is to support um, foundations and uh, other partners who are uh, wanting to collect data in the rare disease space. It's also a platform for individuals to manage their own health 
um, and wellness. And in particular, the sweet spot really is in the rare disease space. Um, and Backpack Health is and was an incredible place to work. Um, and we were, it was acquired by Conica Minolta um, in 2020. And then subsequently um, that platform is, is being shifted a bit. And so my role was no longer needed um, at Backpack. But I learned a lot in my you know, two years that I was there. And I met incredible foundation leaders who were doing just the most important work in rare disease, um, a public health crisis I had no idea about until I joined Backpack Health. Um, and now, you know, realizing there are 9,000 rare diseases, um, that rare disease types around the world and 350 million people who are impacted by them and families who can't pay medical bills and researchers who don't have the funding to, you know, understand, um, you know, genes and, and how they're impacting, you know, folks with these different rare presentations. And it's just medically fascinating and, you know, familiarly heartbreaking um, and just an area where I'm excited to be able to, to be working in now. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think it's so important for you to highlight that there are a lot of these people with the with, with rare diseases and conditions and there isn't there are a lot of people who don't have money to pay for whatever treatment it is or they don't know how to treat them properly and there's also a lack of funding for research that is very specific and as as opposed yeah. to to things that are like pop more population level that affects a lot of people because there's just more money in that which is kind of unethical in itself but i guess that's yeah. that's that's the way of the world unfortunately do, do you did you work nationally with this organization yeah so backpack was available in um six different language languages in 100 different countries um and so it was fully gdpr compliant worked all over the world um managed a 30 little more than 30 different foundations in different condition areas um, yeah, that's really awesome. Would uh, do you know? Mm -hmm. Could you name a couple of the foundations working in this rare disease space? If you can just name like two or three, possibly. Yeah. So Project Alive was uh, one of my first clients, and just love them dearly. Um, they are, are a foundation started by a mom whose child was impacted by Hunter syndrome or MTS two. Um, primarily affects boys at a young age, starting around, you start to see symptoms around uh, 18 months to two years old, and um, it is a life limiting um, condition. And just the most heartening folks that I met with Project Alive, and, you know, I keep a picture of, of Cole, um, you know, on my desk and uh, yeah, just really changed my life knowing knowing them, knowing Melissa, knowing Project Alive, their boys, and so many of those family stories as well. Um, and that was really my first foray into rare disease. And so Hunter syndrome has an absolute special place in my heart. Um, but so many foundations I worked with are just incredible. The Brace Support and Information Group, Jack Johnson was the founder of that group himself impacted by Fibre disease, which has only one treatment on the market right now. Um, so while not life limiting, certainly impacting quality of life, and it's a genetic familial um, uh, hereditary disease. And so what's really needed in that area is that primarily the studies show that men present with symptoms, but we know women are the carriers. It's an X-linked genetic condition. And so what about the girls? And actually one of my colleagues, um, Taylor runs a, um, a foundation called Remember the Girls because there are a whole host of these X-linked genetic conditions where we don't think the women have any symptoms because they haven't been studied. And so there's a whole you know, level of research out there um, that we just don't know about. And I think that that's gonna be you know, that along with this precision medicine, getting to these platforms where um, you know, the genetic, the gene therapy can be um, changed just slightly for one individual, you know, like the, when we get to the part where we're treating people with 
one person in the whole world that has this genetic connection. Like that's, we're gonna get there soon, um, but it's how do we make it cost-effective? How do we make it accessible? How do we help people who don't have the privilege of getting genetic testing to understand what their conditions are, think they're just living with these you know, terrible symptoms and there's no condition for it. How do we help those folks get access to genetic testing, get access to these world-renowned researchers? You know, right now, most folks who get genetic testing, who get a diagnosis, who end up on large platforms talking about their rare disease, have a lot of money, end up raising a lot of money. Um, maybe they have connections. You know, what about, what about the kids who don't have access to those things? That's what I, that's what keeps me up at night now in this new era of, you know, just thinking about how do we really improve access to, you know, to, to all of those, um, all of those necessary supports to get tested. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you mentioned something important there that a lot of research that we do in general is usually on men and it, it's really, it, there's a lot of ethical issues in that in itself, um, but it just goes to show like we still have so far to go as a society in medicine, pharmacy, public health, everything related to that. But there, there is a lot of hope for um, yeah. genomics, bio, bio, um, genetic, biogenomics, genomics, um, like gene editing techniques. And because I, I know CRISPR has been around for maybe like eight years or so, but I, I know there's a, a, lot, a lot more that's going on in that biogenomics world. And, and I know it's very exciting for people with these rare diseases with specific one gene that's like messing up, like expressing in this way that's causing all these different issues. So I'm, um, I do yeah. hope that that we are they have ways to to get the course down for these things. People can have their genomes run, and we can solve these issues not only here in the U.S. but across the world in more impoverished countries where they might have infrastructure or resources for for these kinds of things. So there is a lot of hope yeah. in, in on that side for sure. Yeah, absolutely, and so many people doing incredible advocacy work at the community level as well. Like, you know, shout out to Care Beyond Diagnosis, which is doing work in South Africa um, and just a whole host of, of organizations that are you know, really trying to raise awareness, really trying to improve access. Um, you know, even, even pharma companies, life sciences companies, they are growing in their patient advocacy work. They are trying to understand, you know, and, and deepen their connection with communities. And I'm just, whenever I see a pharma company really trying to do that with a, you know, someone working in a patient advocacy role doing work, um, I'm so appreciative. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, that's, that's it's exciting too. I, did, I had no idea public health people worked in biotech. Another revelation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I feel like there's there's so much to learn and and to grow in in that field, and there's just a lot of opportunities for things that we probably can't even fathom right now, um, for sure. Um, and then, so after this role, you you moved on to your current role as a senior patient engagement ma uh, manager at All Stripes. So, how how long have you been been in this role? Oh, this is week four. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Congra congratulations on, on the switch. So what, what made what made you want to switch? Or did you say that the company dissolved? Did I, did I register that correctly? Yeah. So um so Backpack Health as a platform um was shifted a bit. And while it still exists, there wasn't a need for my role any longer. And so um I hit the market. It was the first time I had ever been laid off in my career. And I was terrified and also a little bit excited because I knew it meant an opportunity, you know, something on the horizon. Um, and, you know, I was treated very well in that act. I was very fortunate um, that they offered me some other roles within the company, but I, my heart was just saying, I want to explore this patient advocacy work more. You know, I've met and made so many amazing relationships with these foundations. I don't wanna just walk away from this. 
So um, all stripes uh, came up in my job search and uh, again, a network connection, right? I applied, I applied cold to probably like a hundred different jobs um, for the first time in my life. I got no call, no, I got two callbacks. Um, and then when I worked my network, I had a lot more interviews. So work your network, even if it means cold outreach on LinkedIn. Hey, we have a third shared third connection. I'm looking at a job at you know such and such. Can you put me in touch with someone? Or are you open to a conversation? So many people opened up doors for me because of cold LinkedIn messages. So shout out to all my cold LinkedIn message folks who are now my connection. Um, because if they hadn't taken my calls, um, you know, I, I I would still probably be looking, honestly, maybe, I don't know. Um, so that is, you know, that's my advice around getting laid off and then trying to find something new. <laughs> this was not fun. Um, but I landed at All Stripes and I'm so happy that I did because from the moment I had my first conversation, um, I was like, completely energized by what the team was doing soundly in rare disease research, a much more robust team than I had been previously been a part of. Um, you know, so many smart people sitting in the room together, um, being on these calls. And so I'm super grateful to be working for All Stripes. My role is quite a bit different than it was at Backpack. Um, so my role is really more focused on growing their ambassador program. So I'm using more uh, marketing type of skills as well as my project management skills and my client relationship note, um, skills. My clients are patients and family caregivers as opposed to foundation leaders, which is you know where I was at Backpack. Um, my skill set is helping to empower patients and families to tell their story about living with rare disease and to, to help them engage with the All Stripes research and what does that data mean for them. Very different, you know, sort of marketing skill set than it is creating logic models, I, certainly creating logic models for the program in the back end, but on the front end, it's more marketing. So I'm excited to learn more about that and to revisit some of those early health communication classes. You know, I've got my textbooks out and I'm looking at the <laughs> communication theories and nerding out on social behavioral theories but um that's what i do now okay awesome no, that's awesome it definitely seems like it fell perfectly into place for you to fall into this role and and do the same type of work but in a more robust team so i'm, I'm glad i'm happy for you and i uh, definitely look forward to seeing all the great things that you do and, and how you all are able to better advocate for those people to speak up on the issues that that are affecting them so thank you for that work is is there any yeah is, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about um at, at, in your role as a senior patient engagement manager um you know i feel like i'm still learning i'm still learning like what the what the role is going to be what it's going to shape up to be um i think something that the team has taught me is not to be afraid to take up space in the room and I'm sort of like slowly stepping in and not wanting to, you know, try to fully transform what they've been doing because what they've been doing has worked. But I'm also, you know, starting to shift into that feeling empowered role to say, okay, this this part of the program is mine. Like I am allowed to take some creative liberties here. And so um, that's exciting. And also I feel incredibly supported and, um, the team is just so healthy, you know, and I think that I, I didn't realize that some of the elements of a healthy team, you know, are simple things like sharing silly memes at work that are work appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when I came on board, like I had all of these email messages with like silly memes and them welcoming Aaron to the team and that kind of playful nature just permeates all of all stripes. And I didn't realize how much I needed that in my work life. And so um, you know, if, if you're in a team that doesn't have that playful nature, but you're craving it, just know that there are workplaces out there that do have that, um, and are still, you know, incredibly well-respected subject matter experts. And like, you can be a world-renowned, you know, um, 
professor and also like silly memes. Like you're allowed to be a human at work. Um, and that's probably the most important lesson I've learned so far and I'll share it. Yeah, I, I think it's important for you to find that cultural fit and, and have that environment where you feel, because you're going to be working there for a good amount of time every day, like throughout the work day. So yeah. it, it's important to have those times where you feel connected to people on those silly things. Like I know for me, like I was scared coming into my role from, from my boss. He looks so serious in pictures, but he he's a guy who boom, breaks up <laughs> the, the funniest or like the worst jokes at the worst points in time and stuff like that. So, and I really, <laughs> I also really enjoy like that, that fun nature in, in our work. So, so thank you for sharing that because that, that's important. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So where would you like to see yourself in the future? Mm. Granted, you just started this role four weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, I am just so excited to watch rare disease research grow. Um, I want to see myself seeing treatments finally come on the market for some of these rare diseases that I know um, have severe impacts to quality of life for individuals living with the condition and also you know, the whole family. And so um, I'd love to see myself somewhere in the future getting to watch that happen, um, getting to see those treatments come to market, getting to help families navigate that they have so many options to choose from and helping families you know, choose from those many options. That's what I would love to see. Yeah, that, that, that is a great vision and I hope that it comes comes by sooner than later because people definitely do need the, the help and support around around these types of conditions. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And then yeah, moving, yeah. Yeah, moving on to the last section of the show, the uh, Furious Five, five questions I ask all the guests. Um, number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Uh ask all the questions, ask so many questions and don't hesitate to knock on closed doors until they open, send cold messages until you finally get a response back from, from folks. Just don't let your fear guide you, you know, just do it, you know, if it feels right, send the message. Even if it don't, doesn't feel right, send the message. Um. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good point of clarification. <laughs> Num number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Um, start with your why. Because this is really emotionally charged work. You're talking to families who are impacted by a rare condition that not a lot of people in the world know about. They may not know how this condition will progress. They may only know that one other person lives with it in the world. They may know that if it's genetically linked that other people in their family could have this condition and not know it because they haven't been genetically tested. It's such a sensitive place to be. Be warm, be kind, and start with why you want to show up every day and use that as your motivation to get through those hard times and take the wins where they come, even if they're small. Great advice. Uh, number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Great question. Um, so I started this book. Where is it? Do I have it? Oh, I don't have it next to me. Um, Conscious leadership, it's a, it's a field of study. Um, so when I started at All Stripes, everyone was finishing up this workshop on the 15 commitments of conscious leadership. And I loved so much about their culture that I was hungry to read it. So I picked up this book and that's something I'm working on is really trying to pause, to be open, honest, accountable, to listen more than I talk, which is really hard for me because I like to talk a lot, um, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a lot more to conscious leadership, but that's kind of what I'm studying right now. Great. Uh, number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? The book I just mentioned, <laughs> um, this podcast, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Professionally, I also recommend a really solid self like wellness plan. So for me, that looks like waking up in the morning and doing a bit of journaling, five things I'm grateful for every day. 
five goals I'm going to accomplish before I go to bed. Really, really simple, but it helps set the tone for my day. And those five things I'm going to accomplish are not always work tasks, right? Sometimes there are things like I'm going to fold the laundry and I'm going to like, I don't know, go to the grocery store, but they're just things that I know I'm going to write, you know, three pages of that essay I've been working on, you know, for my own personal work. Um, it just helps center you and, and feel like you have control over your day. Even if the world wakes up at 9 a.m. and starts calling, if you're starting on, you know, five hours of Zoom, you have that, that little bit of, for yourself in the morning. Yeah, and I think that's important. I've also been doing that, making sure you set aside time for yourself because, yeah, you got, I feel like we need, we sometimes get too encroached in like our jobs and other things, and we don't even set aside time for us to do things to better ourselves just like personally. I think journaling at the beginning of your day is a great way to, to start your day, to just get good with yourself as you go forward, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Some people like to go for a run. I'm not a runner. I'm a hiker. So I start with journaling. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and last but not least, where can people connect with you? Uh, so um, LinkedIn is a great way. Just shoot me a message. Um, I'm on there pretty frequently. Uh, I am supposed to start a Twitter account, but I'm quite nervous about doing such a thing. But um, eventually maybe you'll find me on Twitter. But for now, you can link in, just message me. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story and all the insights. Uh, there are definitely a lot of great insights and just information for students as well as professionals to, to take and run with for, the, for their careers. So I appreciate you coming on today. Awesome. So happy to. Thank you for having me on. I really enjoyed getting to know you a little bit and, and chatting you know, on this podcast. It was fun. Yeah, truly, truly my pleasure. So just some housekeeping items. Um, thank you everyone for watching this or listening to this. If you're listening to this on the podcast platform, I appreciate you. Make sure that you subscribe, um, leave a like, leave a comment, leave a review, share it with a friend, and uh, I will see you all next week. But thank you so much for tuning in today. The Public Health Millennial out. <laughs>